Hello, current viewers on Facebook Live and current and future listeners from wherever you are. Uh, welcome to Fantasy Island. Wait, wait, that's a different show. Uh, welcome to another episode of Talk Story with More Equitable Democracy. I'm George Chung, uh, MED's Executive Director, and I'm super happy to be here with you today. Uh, we're coming to you today from Seattle, Washington, the ancestral home of the Duwamish, Muckleshoot, and Stillaguamish people. And our guest today is Cha Vang. Cha, can you tell us about the land that you're on? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, as George said, my name is Cha Vang. Uh, I am coming from the land of the Nisanan and the Miwok uh, indigenous people here, in, which currently now is Sacramento. Awesome. All right. Let's talk story. Those of you who've tuned in before would remember that talk story is a Hawaiian pidgin term meaning to converse, share experiences, be raw, authentic, and thus bond with those you're sharing with. Uh, Hawaiian history is passed down through oral language and stories in this way from generation to generation uh, and is still alive as well as a part of native Hawaiian and local culture in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, it's really important to remember that today given the tragedies that have happened uh, in Maui in particular. So we're talking story with leaders of color who are reshaping and transforming our democracy. Are you ready to dig in? I definitely am. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, today we're joined by Cha Vang, uh, Deputy Director of Politics and Partnerships at AAPI Force and AAPI Force Education Fund. Cha has been a community organizer working tirelessly to improve outcomes for children and families for more than a decade. She has worked on issues ranging from education to food justice to civic engagement and democracy reform uh, and works to ensure communities get the resources they deserve to thrive and that they're at the decision making tables. Currently, she is Deputy Director of Politics and Partnerships at, at AAPI, AAPI's for Civic Empowerment Education Fund uh, and AAPI Force, a statewide alliance which advances policies, campaigns and issues that support working class AAPIs through voter mobilization, and base building. Uh, she's also co-founder of Hmong Innovating Politics, or HIP, uh, and previously served as the founding executive director. Uh, Cha was born in the refugee camps of Thailand and raised in South Sacramento. Uh, she serves as a board member of the California Racial and Identity Profiling Advisory Board for the Office of the Attorney General, uh, organized Sacramento and the Sacramento Metropolitan Lions Club. Hello mm -hmm. and welcome, Cha. Thank you, George. Thank you for having me on this talk show. All right. Thanks for being had. Ba -dum -bum. Uh, so Cha, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where does the story of your activism begin? Did a specific person or experience in particular inspire you to do the work that you do? You know, um, I would say I feel like everybody who's come through my life has been an inspiration in some ways or another. Um, I would say my whole entire identity as a refugee kid is, um, is political in that even if I didn't want to be political, um, I had to be political uh, and I have to, you know, the activism is something that you don't see as a part of like the everyday struggles, but I, I think it is actually crucial to advancing all the things that our community needs. So my story really starts in the refugee camps and my family came here in the late eighties and we resettled in Sacramento. But as she, uh, we all know that a lot of the refugees that come into the U S actually get resettled into other poor under-resourced uh, communities of color. And we are kind of, we are definitely pit against each other for, for the little resources that the um, systems actually give us. Uh, and then we're always over police, but as a kid, um, I never really felt poor because we always had food on the table, but that was because of the resource, resourcefulness of my family. But like, that's not to say, I, I think the realization of like how, how the systems actually has impacted my life didn't actually come until college where, you know, I was a sociology major, but never connecting it back to like what is happening in my life growing up and in the in the everyday life, academic tends to be kind of outside of the space of like understanding how to connect everything. And so sometimes, um, and I, I would say my activism really kicked off um, 
during uh, in California, we had a prop eight. Prop eight, yes, is a prop eight or now I'm like lost, but um, it's the uh, it, it's actually a ban on um, on uh, same sex marriages. And we really, you know, I think that was actually my catalyst to be more actively involved in politics, but also in the whatever, in the movement, in the work that needed to be done. Um, it was actually an eye-opening uh, moment for me to also learn about individual politics and in, with the people around me and what it means to like have a value that actually sees everyone as uh, equal humans and that they deserve what they you know, deserve to to also live the life that they want, right? And so uh, that actually is my catalyst to being a lot more active in my activism and the work that I do now. Wow, that's very inspiring. What was it like to talk about uh, marriage equality in immigrant communities? Yeah, you know, it was. it's hard enough to talk to my family. You know, I have a <laughs> mixed family of like, where traditionally we are, um, we sell, we practice shamanism, which, mm -hmm. and the belief in ancestors, which, you know, I think for us, the understanding that um, it's never connected to religion, but it's actually connected, the understanding of same-sex marriages is actually connected to experiences and exposure to culture, rather mm -hmm. than to actually religious beliefs. Where, mm -hmm. uh, because I say that because a lot of our Hmong community um, actually lived in isolation in the mountains of like Laos and uh, in the refugees camps in Thailand and same thing for in China, but like the exposure to just, um, you know, same sex marriages and you know, folks who are gay, lesbian actually didn't exist. And so the opportunities to have those conversations about what does it mean to support or uh, reject uh, young people who, or people who um, believe in same sex marriages, right? And then there's also my family member who are Christians who think that it is against religion to practice. And mm -hmm. it was like a conversation around like, yeah, you know, you can have your own religious belief. You can have your own beliefs. But at the end of the day, like who are like, this is actually not affecting your life and that these individuals actually deserve the same rights and the same um the same opportunities to love who they want um, as you do, right? And that shouldn't be a religious or this shouldn't be a cultural thing for us to like, or, or Hmong culture thing for us to deny anybody that right. Whew, wow, uh, that's very inspiring. And uh, thank you for that work. Yeah. Um, if we could back up just a little bit and talk a little bit more about um, being resettled in Sacramento, um, what was that experience like in terms of uh, how did growing up there uh, shape your experiences of public policy and democracy? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the kind of two tales of Sacramento as you, as you experienced it? Yeah. So Sacramento is the state capital of California. It hasn't always been, but from the times, from the period that I've lived there, it's always been the capital of California. Uh, many don't know because nobody comes to Sacramento unless you're a legislator <laughs> or you're coming there to do some kind of state legis or state or federal legislation. Um, but this tell to Sacramento is like, I grew up in South Sacramento. Um, as I mentioned earlier, predominantly like uh, people, Black, Indigenous, people of color community, uh, um, historically disinvested, uh, overly and over police um, neighborhood and and you know it is actually a, about a 10 to 15 minute drive but when you're like that's far enough that you never get to the capital so the understanding of what to sacramento means is that people who actually live in sacramento in the parts of sacramento that are um that we our communities are in actually never get to the capital and so mm -hmm. the people who live around the capital and the neighborhoods around downtown actually are transplants from other places and they move to mm -hmm. Sacramento to work in the capital. And so they don't re really interact with communities outside of that area and communities outside of that area actually never communicate. And so growing up, we never had, we didn't think we had access to the capital, right? 
And as we, as I've been able to experience growing up, that our an understanding that these individuals who are in the capital are getting paid by our tax money, our, our representatives that we elect, and that the capital is actually accessible, and, and we all deserve to be able to have access to it uh, equally. And it's not just for touristy, but like that we do, that communities uh, can demand for the things that they uh, need and they deserve in the capital, right? With the legislators, even with legislators who are not representative of their areas, and that um, and so the the understanding of like connecting the two and that this shouldn't be, but there is two Sacramento's. And when people, we we get angry when people in, outside of Sacramento is like, people, Sacramento always messes up the state. I'm like, no, <laughs> Sacramento does not mess up the state. The legislators who live in the Sacramento mess up the state. Like, let's or let's not mess. Let's not uh, contribute to the rest of Sacramento. But um, I, it's an ongoing uh, conversation about like, what does it mean to have access to that building, and what does it mean to be to have to exercise the power that you have um, in that building to make the changes that you des uh, our communities deserve, right? And right. this is, you know, I, I think this is actually democracy in practice of like, this is like, we we sh we are not actually, the electeds are actually, the power is within the people and the electeds are not like this big person who you like worship and like they can do everything they do whatever they want, but that you actually are this. It's a it's a give and take relationship that we need. Uh, community sh should be engaged in, and that it is actually the right to be able to engage in that in conver those conversations. Absolutely, it's great to demand that right. Yeah, um, great. So you know, we come to this work with so many different identities and histories from different communities, which can be defined in many ways. So. Will you play a game with me called My People, My People, Cha? Yes, I will. All right. Here's how it goes. So, for example, uh, I might say, um, my people love the smell of fermented shrimp paste. And you might respond, my people uh, will answer your question when they're good and ready, not before. <laughs> uh, and then we'll go and look at each other and wonder what each thing really means. So we're going to put 90 seconds on the clock. Okay. Uh, I will go first. Um, ready, set, go. Uh, my people like to plan vacations around Depeche Mode concerts. Mm, my people uh, are skilled adapters who till every land they settled in and feed their, to feed their families and their neighbors and their communities. Wow, that one's a deep one. This one's not as deep. My people... <laughs> love to eat um, chicken feet, but try not to think about it. My chick, my people eat every part of every animal because uh, when they have access to meat. Yes, yes. Uh, my people play spades until someone cries and then we'll keep playing. Mm. Mine's is, this next one is gonna be a little darker, but it's real. Uh, my people are refugees who are displaced by war. Yes, yes. Um, my people, by accident of history, have two passports. Mm -hmm. um, my people are res resilient among women in across uh, the United States. Right. Uh, my people came out during the AIDS pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um. My people are progressive movement leaders who continue to love their communities and the movement. Nice. Uh, I think that run that means we've run out of time. Um, thank you for playing our game. Um, okay, enough about the mystery and intrigue. Um, can you unpack some of those answers and tell us more about the communities that shape your work? Uh, say more about who are your people? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think my people, as much as I love and my, my folks, I also have my people, I tend to levitate towards 
like Hmong Americans first and then Southeast Asians and the overall. Um, and I, it's a love hate relationship because they're also the hardest people to move because, yeah. but it's also the, because you love them so much yes. and, um, and you never want to give up. And so, um, you know, my people tend to be, you know, folks who have been, as I mentioned earlier, refugees who have been displaced by war and who come to the U.S. or come to countries that with nothing and with language barriers and they t they continue to thrive and or they continue to be resilient and like and be able to find and adapt to wherever they uh, they land and be able to also grow and uh, root themselves in the locations that they uh, are settled in. Awesome. Um, you know, your work around marriage equality and talking about your community really strikes such a chord in me. Um, when I, um, after I came out and I met my current partner, uh, we, and after marriage equality uh, became the law of the land, uh, of course, we decided to get married. And so mm -hmm. it was the oddest thing to feel uncomfortable telling my parents that we're going to get married because, you know, all this kind of cultural baggage that we bring. And I remember... Uh, meeting them up for dim sum and I was just trying to like figure out like how do I say this like I don't have the words in Cantonese yeah. to really get it out before I started saying anything my father like pushes this check across the table and he says oh this is to like pay for all the wedding stuff because I know it's going to be expensive and I'm like wow yeah I started to cry so uh I feel like um the work that you do uh to really um meet people where they're at as hard as it is is really powerful and it changes people's lives. So thank you. Uh, all right, so how insightful to learn about your people. Um, now let's talk about your work. Uh, tell us about AAPI Force. Um, what have been your recent wins and successes? Yeah, um, so API Force is, as uh, mentioned in my uh, bio, is an alliance of Asian American organizations, uh, Asian American serving um, organizations in California, across California, that um, builds, and we work towards building progressive um, movements, and we do that through, and building a powerful API uh, political bloc in California. And we do that by um, our, what we call our integrated voter engagement. And it's really not a long, a new term, but it's more a, 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 a trendy turn, a term in terms of integrated vote engagement, but it means like organizing. And this is what our community has done and many of our organizations continue to do is organizing all year long because you know we know that our, our communities have historically also been a nor and like not engaged in the political um, system. And so our work has to be ongoing in that it can't just happen um, during election cycles every two years and that our communities actually need um, deeper conversations, deeper relationship buildings. And so our work is really around um, supporting organizations and building their capacity to be able to run civic engagement programs all year long. And that this actually goes into building power, moving uh, power for our Asian American communities. And we also do a lot of policy work uh, um, particularly around democracy reform. We know that um, our, uh, what we call our steering committee organizations um, all work on different issues, but as a statewide organization that's focused on building civic engagement uh, infrastructure and um, empower that we need to actually do more work around how to eliminate barriers for us to build that political power for our communities and then also for our communities to engage, right? And so our work around policy is very focused on democracy reform in addition to our coalition work that we do in terms of housing, um, climate change, economic uh, justice, and, um, and also our healthcare uh, workers and with some of our organization that does domestic healthcare worker uh, rights work um, has also been some of the things that we've been supporting, but our focus has always been a more democracy reform work. That's great. Any particular policy victories that you want to tout? 
Yeah, you know, I think uh, we're not, we're hoping, we just kind of started doing a lot of our um, policy work, but not quite, I we would call it a success, but um, we're hoping to pass what we call um, a s secure automatic voter registration. Um, our state, the state of California actually currently has a, a automatic voter registration system that people would opt in rather than a system that actually automatically registers them. And we, um, and that system has worked so far, but uh, it has actually limited the number of people who still is not, are not registered and eligible. And so in California, we still have about 4.75 million um, eligible non-registered voters who are uh, black, indigenous and people of color and live in critical parts of the state that um, we need to win more progressive uh, policies. And so, you know, one of the things that we've been working on and which we're hoping to pass next year, but um, we were able to revise it, uh, revive it uh, after a lot of a lot of oppositions. And we've been able to build a coalition that um, is a strong in their ground campaigns and also uh, all, also very savvy in policies and uh, making sure that we also know that this is not just a, um, a, civil, a civil engagement problem, but actually this is a um, voting rights like issue for all our folks. And like our partners at the Black Power Network, uh, the California Black, Black Power Network working on reparation work is also like very connected to like um, bring, uh, enfranchising um, incarcerated folks to the to be able to vote again. Great. It just seems like uh, in many ways, uh, California does lead the country in terms of democracy reforms, but still uh, there is really important work to do. Yeah. Uh, one place where there seems to be a lot of work to do is Los Angeles. So as many of us heard last October, the Los Angeles City Council members were censured for purposefully excluding Black voters from securing representation through redrawn city uh, council districts that protected certain incumbents. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And how can we push for a democracy where representation for one community doesn't come at the cost of another? Yeah. Uh, let me start by saying that that city council um, um, debacle, that's what we're calling it. Um, it's not about individual groups. It's not about communities. Um, it's not about the Latino communities against uh, Black communities, but it is actually about individuals and the, the abuse of their power, right? Um, that they actually are undermining the trust of the constituents rather than actually representing their, their own communities and the constituents who live in the district. And so it is not, you know, it was very focused on a very anti-Black, anti-LGBTQ uh, plus. And then uh, one of the things that really didn't, um, wasn't highlighted was it was also uh, very anti-Asian, right? Because, um, and so it was, you know, I, I think our work has been very focused on making sure that our partners across the state, and that's like our Black partners, our Latino organizational partners, we're like supporting them and making sure that we're aligned in our uh, in our uh, statements. Um, we did actually release a statement to, you know, support the Black, uh, the California Black Power Network's decision to ask for, um, for resignation of um, the council members who sat on the, who made those comments. But that was, you know, that was years of um, building relationships, trust, and that one incident actually is not a reflection of the movement that we've been able to build uh, throughout the how many years that we've been, like 10 plus years that we've been working together. And that this is actually, that, that we would not use this as an opportunity to divide our communities. And we're, uh, we're actually stronger when we com oh, come together and have these conversations about what does it mean to have a system and a, a system of redistricting, a system of election that is more representative, is more accountable to the 
constituents that they um, they represent, and also that we are creating systems that prevent these kind of situations from happening again. Right. Right. Yeah, I want to focus on what you said in terms of. Uh, it's not about the communities, it's about the systems that create these challenges. I remember having a conversation with a colleague the other day uh, where she got a little defensive about what was happening. And she said, look, politicians are politicians. They're going to try to protect themselves. I said, sure, but we have a city council that's supposed to be reflective of our communities. And if it's skewed in certain ways, because some politicians have a lot of way." Uh, uh, methods to block different communities from having power. The system is the problem. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's a really important thing for all of us to understand. So uh, let's pivot and talk about um, uh, other electoral justice work. Uh, what other work around electoral justice are you focused on in California right now? Yeah, you know, I, um, I was going to bring that up earlier I, um, around you know, our work, we've, we've been kind of exploring what are some of the opportunities that we can develop, as you had said, or like push for more um, systems that allow for our folks to be more representative, not just, not just identity uh, representation, but actually also a values aligned uh, representation, right? And uh, one of the things that we, um, you know, California, uh, Voting Rights um, Act is, I would say, is one of the more progressive, and um, and we have been able to move different th uh, policies in some of our work. But at the end of the day, like there's still more more improvements to make. We've used the Voting Rights Act for language access stuff in California. Um, you know, also uh, pro language access and. Um, voting systems in local local elections. And then also like we've been also exploring like what is it um, we're hoping there is, uh, we're keeping an eye out for Albany, uh, California, which is going to um, implement their first um, ranked choice voting at large system, which is a part of more of a proportional representation uh, system. Um, they're going to actually uh, do it in the city council in November of this of um, next year, and mm -hmm. we're looking forward to just kind of seeing what are the ways we can actually um, how how it how it has improved the system locally, and then what does it mean? What are the implica implications, and how we expand um, this work into a statewide and also in other jurisdictions in California? Yeah. Nice. Um, which then leads me to my next question is, what solutions uh, is, uh, will AAPI Force be supporting uh, to push towards a more proportional representative democracy in California and beyond? Yeah. Um, you know, I think our, our work in terms of how um, electoral systems um, are functioning in California are going to be some of the key things that will actually inform our work moving forward to. Um, as and in addition to our uh, secure automatic voter registration system, there's also um, some of our work involves around. Um, we've been really focused on that because it's been a harder fight than we thought it was going to be. But some of the things that we've been uh, we've worked on and which we will continue to uh, bring back is like um, mandatory top two elections, which allows us to force every um, primary elections into a uh, to have a runoff um you know we you i believe in other states too but in, in particular in california at the local level our um most of our candidates win uh win at a during the primaries um with a 51 plus and plus one 50 plus one a vote and actually that allows that doesn't allow our communities to engage in the uh, electoral system because we know that primaries have lower turnouts than general elections. And we, last year, we were, um, I'm a, on the board of Organized Sacramento and um, on that board, that, the, that organization has been working on moving um, local county elections to um, presidential election years, right? Mm -hmm. So that, 
it's not in midterms and that we have more turnout. And so the goal uh, continuing to like, now that we've had it in, now we have it in um, presidential election years, we can actually try to push it for top two, um, mandatory top two runoffs. And so that we can actually get our folks to go out and force candidates to campaign in a way where it's communicating to all the constituents and rather than to the, the top, uh, high propensity voters that will just pop, will always vote, but that they're actually, uh, they also value the the votes of our, the folks who don't always come out, right? Right. Uh, I've heard the critique, and I am certainly on board in terms of moving to uh, on-cycle elections where there is higher turnout, but some people say, well, maybe it's easier to communicate about local elections when there aren't when there isn't a lot of competition uh, around higher profile elections, what do you say to that? I would say, um, I would say it's not true because I feel like high profile, like folks, smaller elections, actually some candidates don't have the, the funding or the, um, to actually promote themselves to also push folks to turn out, right? High, high um, like presidential elections actually get a lot more turnout and people tend to go through the ballots rather than just voting. And so um, the, you know, the goal is like really during midterms, people are paying less attention. Even if you're getting materials out, like people are less likely to go out than it is on a presidential where you're bombarded with a lot of high profile um, races and high profile elections. And that actually turns people out. And then um, that allows you to kind of do more um, education around like voting down the ballots and really just not stopping at the big name uh, elections, right? Right. Right. I also feel like uh, there's such a strong connection between local government and state government that trying to have elections totally separately, given mm -hmm. that, you know, local government often relies on state government for funding that you can't really talk about. I, I know here we we separate those elections largely. And a lot of people who run for a local government say, well, I'm just going to go down to the state legislature and demand more money. Well, OK, yeah. it would be great to have some candidates who are running for state legislature talk about is that actually going to happen? Are you going to work together or what's going to, yeah. what's going to fly? That's right. That's right. Right. Uh, good. Um, all right. Well, we are now rounding the corner to wrap this up. Uh, we're going to wrap this up with a quiz that we call name that state. Uh, so provide your response in the form of a question like an unnamed popular game show, because we certainly don't want to get into legal jeopardy by saying <laughs> anything inappropriate. Right. Uh, all right. First up, the, the answer is Harvey Milk was the first openly gay elected official in this state. Mm. Uh, what is California? What is California? Ding, ding, ding. That is correct. Mm. Uh, Harvey Milk, um, uh, a supervisor in the city of San Francisco. There's been quite a number of documentaries done about his life um, was uh, certainly a hero in uh, my career, um, was unfortunately uh, assassinated um, at the end uh, 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 that ended his, his life and his career. All right, let's move on. Um, next answer, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris is the former Attorney General and Senator from this state. Uh, um, what is California? That one. What is California? That is correct <laughs> also. Um, it's you all have a lot of clout in the White House, given that uh, you have someone from your great state um, doing what they can uh, to remember that California is a really important place. Uh, and then finally, uh, this state, um, in the state, two famous actors have served as governor, uh, including the governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Ronald Reagan who went on to become U.S. president. Mm. What is California? What is California? Oh my gosh, there might have been a pattern to those questions. Um, you win. Everybody wins. 
All right. Well, thanks so much for being here, uh, Cha, uh, talking to us and playing our silly games. Um, any parting thoughts? No, I just thank you again for having me on this and hopefully we can continue to have these conversations about what proportional representation can do for our states. All right. And uh, how can people find you and what can they do to support you? Yes, we are. Um, you can actually find us on our website. It's um, www.apiforce-ef.org. Or you can find us on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter, or the new thing, X. <laughs> We're not as active on Twitter, but definitely on Facebook and Instagram, you can find us on there in the same hash, uh, same tag. Excellent. All right. We are dropping those links in the comments. Uh, so please go visit. And if you are so moved, uh, please make a contribution, as I will be doing right after this um, conversation's over, just to thank you uh, for your work, Cha. All right. Thank you. I appreciate your time. And take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.